Okay, what I'm going to talk about today are the different database types out there, just so we can see you know, where do we want to go, what type of features are we expecting from uh, our database. Uh, so I'm going to do this by the types of the data that's managed, because there's you know people say our oh, in-memory database is a type. Well, it, it is, but it isn't. I mean, it, it's de it's really down to the type of data you're managing as to what database you should use and what your application domain is. So that's how we're going to break things down today. So, for example, you can be a relational database, but also an in-memory database. You can be a graph database, but also an in-memory database. So, um, I'm doing I'm categorizing this by type. So, by far the most common, although it's not really a database management system, but by far the most common. It's a file system. You store stuff on a file and you retrieve it, and that's basically what we've done so far um, with our simple key value store implementation. Well, the most common database out there is still at the moment a relational database. So these are your Oracles, your MySQL, your Postgres, um, your SQLite, which is actually the most common uh, relational database, and that's a uh, in you know in a uh, it's an embedded database that's used in a lot of mobile phone software. So pretty much every mobile phone app you use will use SQLite under the hood uh, to store its data and its configuration. So relational databases everywhere, they power most things, um, most payment systems are relational. Um, so that's kind of the, the most common one today. And there's two kind of subtypes in there really. There's operational systems where you're storing and retrieving them uh, individual bits of data that make sense to the user. And then there's analytical systems that take that data, change its format so it makes it more efficient for querying. So you do have to do that with relational databases. A little bit inefficient, but um, you know that's that's what you have to do for analytics sometimes. You have to change the format to make the analytics quicker or more useful. And then there's other types as well. So um, one of the types you'll hear about is NoSQL. This is it should have been called really non-relational or not only relational rather than no SQL because it's no doesn't stand for doesn't support SQL it stands for not only um, the idea being that the original query mechanisms were by command line like we've done basically with our the value implementation um, so unsurprisingly um, a key value store is one type of that uh, going up from that you will have a column store um, and I'll explain these types because they are good to talk about and then above that, people then start trying to store the kind of documents, um, so document store. And above that, you tend to have triple or graph stores, depending on what application uh, you're doing. Now, what a lot of these NoSQL databases have in common is the, um, the way they do storage and indexing and the way it scales across multiple machines. Um, and a lot of the way they're organized was inspired by a couple of different movements. Um, one of them being kind of search engines. So really a lot of search engines these days, so second generation, I'm, I'm calling them. So not your enterprise search that you might remember from the uh, early to mid noughties, but um, your second generation um search engines, so your modern ones like Elasticsearch and Solar, which really took some of the concepts that were in kind of web search engines and tried to apply them to almost a database management system. But these are like your Elks, you know, your Elasticsearches and Solars and whatnot. Um, so they're the kind of most common ones uh, that you'll find. And like I say, you do get other types as well. So you'll get um, Types that aren't really types by the data they store, but one which is almost a type, and I hesitate to put it on a lot, is an object store. Um, and there's two different types of object store. There's the kind of modern ones that you'll know about, you'll have heard of. Um, so these are really um, kind of cloud um, object stores. So these are like your S3 uh, of these world of this world, and then there's what I would class more as a programmer's object store, and this is more of a like kind of um, shared um, memory store. Uh, so this is like things like 
Java objects in there and some example products there are coherence and terracotta um, so they're quite common in that space um, you could also put in things there uh, like uh, for example gemfire as well I have to give that a mention obviously uh, and they're kind of object stores but really when you're looking into how to compare these things you know common to niche types this is the most common one by far then relational then kind of NoSQL databases and object stores you also then get probably somewhat more common than object stores at the moment um, but not really I wouldn't class as a database management system but although they they do have database query on top of them you get a kind of big data storage so Hadoop and then within that you get the kind of query layers on top of that so you'll get a kind of spark uh, slash hive2 um, slash 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 there's a whole bunch of you know database-esque either query products or products that use Hadoop as storage and put a, a, a database type on top of it normally it's one of these but that is this is basically a Hadoop think of it as a massively distributed file system with some cool stuff on top that's the easiest way of thinking about it um, that's probably still more common than object stores at the moment but these are by far going to overtake Hadoop I think because they take the concepts in Hadoop like simple storage um, and then lay a whole bunch of other services on top and you can plug and play as you want you don't have to manage your own um, area so these cloud object stores are going to overtake these are kind of well these two in particular are very legacy and they're down to um, stateful Java services needing to main state across multiple nodes so this is like if you've got a web service that needs to store like your current shopping cart before you commit it those type of things uh, they also use a lot in trading financial services using memory databases for live trader uh, monitoring and management and um, so you'll see them everywhere and gemfire is a kind of modern in-memory data grid loads of configuration options um so this is kind of like a third generation um kind of java object store if you like already these ones are kind of overtaking things but we're not talking about basic storage we're talking about stuff we do on top of it so we're not really interested in these things what we are interested in are these two categories. They are by far um, the ones we're most interested in. So let's make them bright orange. Boom. Ooh, that's a bit too bright. Um, stand by, stand by. A bit of a dark orange there. There we go. These are the ones we're kind of interested in. So these are true database management systems, whereas these things are more storage with a bit of query on top. Okay. Um, so what can we do with these things that we couldn't do before we had these things? That's probably quite a useful way of uh, thinking about things. So one of these things was uh, um, so you can query across records. So query across multiple records, which records match X, Y, and Z. That was absolutely fundamental to this. But also you can uh, not just query, but you can also summarize data across records. Uh, this is an often kind of overlooked one, but really, you know, being able to query data is not that useful. But being able to push analytics down is very useful. Um, so yeah, push down uh, UDFs or user-defined functions is kind of NoSQL analytical capability. Um, very common. What you might, be, if you're from a relational world, you might call these uh, stored procedures. Um, now, UDFs are somewhat more sophisticated. So, a stored procedure might use a UDF, for example. Um, um, stored procedure is if you think, you know, you, you run a summarized query quite often. Um, rather than you pass the query and then it build the query, you can store that query in the database and it can always make sure that those um results are available so it's like a pre-computed query now what udf does is say well okay in that query i want to do you know instead of mean mode median maybe i want to do some other statistical calculation over that data that's not built into the database so i'm going to define my own function um and that function is a hence a user defined function and then you can call that user defined function from your stored procedures so uh, this is quite a lot 
more common, I would say, in um, NoSQL databases than it is in relational. Because in relational, you've got quite a rich model. Like the entire model was a mathematical derived model. So the model was built to do these queries, so you don't really extend it that often. Whereas, well, depending on who you are. <laughs> um, whereas in NoSQL, people tend to you know, want to write. There's not a lot of query functionality built in, and what you store is very unique to your application. So therefore, you have more of a need to define user-defined functions. So these are kind of user-defined queries here. But you'll notice that... Uh, you know, these are all around querying, but what about the data? Well, the data here is effectively, uh, you know, tables with columns. And you've also got tables related to other tables, hence relational. And this basically says rather than just storing a file, you say, well, this field actually points towards this other record in another table. So that's really you know, the data storage there. Um, in these, unsurprisingly, you've got different types of data stored. So key values, you can either store a binary blob, very common. Um, so especially when you, you know, the application cares what the type is, but this database storage doesn't, it just needs to be ridiculously fast. So that's what a lot of key value stars use. So you tend to store binary blobs in there, but you can also store basic types. So string, int, date, etc. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, some of them support, and I'll put this as an optional, they will support data structures. So I'm thinking there, Redis in particular, that's quite a unique feature, Redis. That it does store data structures. So this is kind of key value store territory there. Um, when you come to column stores though, it gets a lot more like this. It's instead of tables with columns, it's tables with sparse columns. Oops, not spares, sparse, and it's with many uh, sparse columns in families. So these are column families. So it might be that you've got a summary column family. It might be that you've got an aggregation column family. Okay, so this is one row, and this is tends to be quite denormalized as well. So rather than a you got a table and the and you've got a column, and that cell's got one value, what you will then tend to have is um, you tend to have lists uh, in there as well. Um, so instead of saying, oh yeah this person's um, address is this value. Well, actually, maybe you've got multiple addresses. Maybe you've got a map in there. So you could have lists. Actually, I'm going to put that in there. You could have lists, maps, and other um, structures. Yeah. Oh, it's not really structure. It's, uh, it's um, not container. It's a word I'm desperately searching for. Uh, not a container type. Anyway, I'm going to put container type until it comes to me. You know what I mean. Multiple instances, etc. We got those. And then uh, I'm going to create a bit more of a gap here. We're rapidly running out of space. So then, what you also have, unsurprisingly, here is you have uh, JSON, XML documents. Sometimes you'll have binary documents. Uh, also, metadata. What a lot of people forget is that you don't generally just store data, you store data about data. You might store data that you're getting from somebody else in an efficient way, but then you might also have to store additional data that's related to that but isn't part of the formal record. Um, so metadata documents are quite common. So you will have, you know, a lot of document stores are basically just JSON document stores. They'll store JSON in um, you know, a storage efficient format, BSON tends to be. Um, you also get XML databases like MatLogic and XMLDB. Uh, some document databases say, oh yeah, we store binary data and we do stuff with it. So MatLogic used to do that. and used to have an optional trigger that would convert, say, a PDF into a HTML representation and store that in the metadata document or in a separate document. So there's quite a lot of stuff you could do there with uh, document stores. And below that, 
we're in triple and graph stores. So this is subject, predicate, object, and optionally, graph name. Yep. Um, and what this is, is if you consider a document structure as being a hierarchy, but you can define the hierarchy how you want, but you have to understand how that particular document type is built in order to be able to query it. What this does is it basically takes a sledgehammer to every type of database you've ever thought of um, and just smashes the data structure and it makes it turns it into a very simple thing, subject, predicate, object. So Adam is a human. Adam likes cheese. Cheese is a foodstuff. So subject, predicate, object. Adam, subject, is a predicate human object. Yeah. And maybe it's, um, you know, Adam has a shopping cart. Shopping cart um, has uh, dog treats. Um, shopping cart, dog treats, there's eight of them. You know, so there's you know, shopping cart, dog treat, quantity eight. You know, there's all, you can basically break that down to whatever structure you want. What's really useful about it is if you understand that very basic structure, you can interpret any um, document that's based on that and these documents tend to be in RDF format and there's lots of different base formats of RDF um, subject predicate object is a bare minimum graph name is sometimes specified where one document's not to do with just one graph you've got multiple graph names in there um, think of graphs as collections uh, and then what you can do with that which is really really interesting is you can okay you can actually um, query across all types of data which is pretty amazing um, and that's sparkle there is the main query language wcc sparkle um, so that is particularly amazing and i love it if you've uh, if you want a good bedtime read um semantic web for the working ontologist great book i highly recommend that one um uh Column stores really are kind of, uh, so this is about querying across records. This is about aggregating down columns a lot of the time, or at least that's in addition to the query mechanisms. And document store is really, um, so some, the basic one is you query um, properties is effectively an element within a document if you're from an XML world. Um, that's what you do there. But the more advanced ones, uh, and therefore it's kind of more optional, is they'll uh, you know query substructure. So only query this part of the document. Um, so that's quite interesting. Document stores are particularly good because a document hierarchy is very, very close to a programming language object graph. So for object-oriented programmers, if you've just got a record and you don't want to worry about how it gets shredded into a relational database, you can just go store this record and then pull it back and that's it, you're done. So for programmers, document stores are so much easier. Um, that tends to be what they're used for a lot of the time. So a lot of startups will start with a document store, uh, for example. And then search engines are interesting in the querying you tend to get term lists and then you will also get um, range queries and you'll also get um, presence of queries um, there's a special name for that but I'm not really to introduce you to that yet so and presence of basically means uh, give me all records instead of saying give me all records that have this <coughs> you say uh, give me all records that don't definitely not have this. And you might be thinking, well, what the hell's the point in that? Well, when you've got billions of records, that last one can be done a lot more efficiently than storing exactly who's got what in. So it's quite a useful query. And search engines um, kind of apply this. Term listing really comes from kind of the way Google indexes the web. Um, so it uses term lists, which is like an inverted index. So I'm going to put that in there. Um, well, really, inverted index is what the, this thing stores. So this is storing uh, inverted index. 
Um, and what they also enable is ridiculously fast querying. So, um, yeah, complex query logic. So you get a lot of databases that are like, oh, we do full text query. Well done. Well, I suppose to be fair, it's quite complicated. So, uh, so term lists are basically full text indexing is not straightforward, but to do it well, you have to spend a lot of time looking at it. Term lists really are the way forward on this. Still to this day, I do not understand why not every database in the world supports term listing. It's just a no brainer to me. So we're going to cover that um, very, very soon because that's going to be the basis of all of this stuff. But if you look at what we've got here, we've got a whole bunch of functionality. Now, you might be there thinking, well, what functionality are we going to implement in this? Well, they're all database stuff that people need to learn. So we're going to do all of them. Um, seriously, we're going to implement the whole shebang um, eventually. Obviously, this is going to take a while, <laughs> right? There's certain basics that you need for all of these things. So really, in order to be able to efficiently query across m columns, you need to be able to store individual items or lists of items against an identifier. So really, if you look, if you boil all of this down, you get to some very core functionality. Um, so let's write that down. So what is underneath all this stuff? Well, store identifier against a value or list of values. Yep. And then you retrieve value efficiently, unsurprisingly. In addition to retrieving the value efficiently, what you also want to do is say, well, okay, um, values in, and then this could be, for example, collection, bucket, um, table, record, index, whatever the thing is, it's basically a grouping um, of values. So I'm not querying one value, I'm, I'm not, so I'm not pulling back one value, I'm not pulling back a list of values, but I'm looking across a group of records, um, so this is rec values across records, really. So if you can query values across records efficiently, or pull them back efficiently, then you're halfway to storing, solving a lot of these problems. Um, that's probably what we're doing. And then what we also want to do is be close to the programmer mental model. So it shouldn't, I don't think we should be making this complex one. That's not really a database feature, but you get the idea. Um, so these features effectively, how are we going to do this? Well, storing uh, identify against value or list of values and retrieving them efficiently. This is really term listing and uh, and hashing. So we'll talk about hashing. Um, this is really what our secret sauce is going to be. And not that off. Okay, so terminus and hashing. Um, querying values across records. Well, this is an interesting one. So this is effectively kind of indexing. So being able to create a kind of reverse index um, uh, or an inverted index is more of a so reverse query, so inverted index, the reverse query. And we'll talk about that later. And then be close to the programmer is effectively um, no external constraints on data stored or structure. Uh, if there's no external constraints on data stored or structure, what's that? This is called schema free. Yeah, so this really is the nub of everything we're doing. Um, there you go. So these three things, if you boil all this down, you can boil down to a very, very simple key value store that does these three things very well. So if you can hash values and use the hash as the way to distribute data 
and to efficiently store, retrieve and query data, then you're on a winner. If you can then use those basic structures of value or list to create an inverted index. Um, so instead of saying this document has these words in, you instead say this word is present in all these document IDs, all these document hashes, more importantly. Um, so that inverted index is really useful and then you can do a reverse query. So because the way you query is you say, oh, give me all documents that mention this word. You don't say, check this document for this word, then check that document for that word. You just don't do it like that, right? So, and this is why relational databases are really popular and why relational databases have a separate operational and analytical schema is that in order to, they came up with a relational model and then went, ah, crap, aggregation queries, mm, not so much when you need to slice and dice, when you're not just querying a value, actually you're doing value by category by category by category in this period of time right so if you can do inverted indexes and reverse queries then you can handle relationships very efficiently you can handle indexes very efficiently indexes are key no joke intended um but if you can do a, a decent inverted index implementation i know people have been doing this for 20 years and they're still not perfected it so you can be a while right <coughs> but if you come up with a decent uh, implementation and then you're on a winner and we'll demonstrate that by doing some kind of word queries across large data sets and then schema free again and this is really about not saying you have to tell the database what structure you've got up front but the database is built in such a way that you can put any structure of data in it but it's still efficient in to query and retrieve that because what a lot of databases do, like a relational database, if you store an object graph in a relational database, you'll store it and it will shred it. And then when you want it back, it will reconstitute it. Um, and even document databases, some do that. You know, they split, right? like they split a document into term lists and then store those term lists. I mean, it's really efficient for amount of storage, but today the amount of storage isn't generally a problem. All you want is a ridiculously quick query. So rather than you know, key value store or return an answer in one maybe two if you're unlucky milliseconds milliseconds right a document store is in the range of 22 milliseconds because it's doing a lot more valuable stuff for you same with relational databases and um, takes a lot longer so the more functionality you bake into a database the slower it goes um so one of the things that i want to do in here as well is avoid richer model leads to uh, slower store retrieve query yeah that's what we want to avoid so the way we're going to implement this is we're going to implement a very very good key value store which is insanely quick and then we're going to layer functionality on top of that so that's fundamentally the structure of what we're doing and what we're storing and how we're going to store it and i'll show you why these things are efficient and if anybody else has got any ideas feel free to throw them out here um but then what we also need to do is think, well, actually, what makes some of these things fast? And the reason some of these things are fast is, well, you know, if you store everything in dev null, it's ridiculously quick, right? Um, you know, you want to make sure that your database is web scale, obviously. Uh -huh. um, now, key value stores are insanely quick because they do a couple of things. One, they don't store memory, they don't store information on disk necessarily when you save it like it's uh, in memory. So there's a whole bunch of extra, uh, what I would call really, I hesitate to call them performance enhancements because it sounds like you're making somebody do drugs. Um, but really, you know, these are, so this here is query search analyze. This is Data structures supported, supporter supported, and then over here we've got um, uh, storage models. Well, storage and distribution models, really. So, what do I mean by distribution models or well, storage models? Let's talk about them first. So, so there's some quite straightforward ones. Uh, so the first one is if you're just in a programming language, you can store stuff in memory really, really quick. So we go from fast to slowest. And here we can, you know, next quickest thing to in memory is just store as a uh, kind of blob. Yeah. 
Um, so this is tends to be what you do if you start in memory. If you start something as a blob and retrieve it, that's ridiculously quick. Um, actually, I'll not pull that in. So behind in memory, what you also have is eventually consistent as a way of storing data. So that basically means, yeah, we've got it in memory. If my server dies, I've lost it, but you're not waiting on the disk right. And then what you'll have is you'll have, um, I think how complicated I want to go very early on here. Um, let's just call this durable and consistent. Yeah. And there's a whole world of pain in this. So I'm going to put this in bold and in salic, I think. Um, so there's a whole world of stuff in there. It includes strong consistency, which is Murphy's law consistency because it isn't. Um, and then it includes acid as well as those type of things. So, and what we're there basically is this is uh, flush to disk. Well, then, because flushing to disk is really, really slow, even if it's an SSD, you'll then want to do journaling. So that's basically where you say, this is the change I'm going to apply, but storing the description of the change is a lot more efficient than applying the change. So journaling is very useful for that. Now, if you're journaling, what you can also do is you can do log shipping. And what that is used for is that is used for replication. So if you've got multiple nodes and multiple database servers, because one could die or one's in a different region or whatever, then you might want to ship data efficiently to that and the most efficient way is not to ship the data is to ship the description of you know it's to ship the raw data not the applied changes to the database so you know log shipping journal shipping um that's a very efficient way of doing that um so this is why storage leads into distribution now <laughs> one of the things on here is that um you know these are not necessarily mutually exclusive weirdly What's happened in the NoSQL world is each NoSQL database has kind of made a bet <laughs> on one or more of these models, and that's their main one, and it's always going to be their main one. It's really, really weird. So Redis, for example, and Key Value Store is by default in memory. Totally makes sense. Um, when you tell it to store to a data uh, store to a file, you can use an append-only file model, which is quite efficient. But it's not quite journaling. Um, but then you can also then tell it to flush to disk if you want. So there's options on top of that. Now I quite like that. What I don't like is that it's neither or. Like you're either you're running it in memory or you're running it on disk. Now as a programmer, what I actually want to do is I want to say, well, for this bucket or for this type of data or even for this record that's, you know, if my latest records are less than a month old, I want them cached in memory, please, because I'm a financial services organization that needs to show everybody what they've done for the last 30 days by default. So I want that in memory. Everything else I absolutely do want secure on disk. Now, trying to do that in a single database at the moment, forget it. Ain't going to happen. It's just not built into the concept of those databases. What they do is they do one storage model, and then they wrap on lots of performance enhancements around that. Where they're like, oh yeah, but we've got an intelligent cache. That means that we build up the cache so it, you know, after the first read it becomes efficient. First read's horrifically slow, but after that it becomes efficient, and people are like, yeah, that's kind of that'll do. But really, what we want to do here, uh, I think, is in this we want a very pluggable model. Um, so we want a very pluggable model, and we want this applying to record. Bucket collection um, database level, and you should be able to choose that. So that's what we're going to implement. Fundamentally, this is what we're going to implement. We're going to start here. We're going to build up, and then this basis and making this super efficient. And we're going to do lots of performance stuff in C plus plus to show you the efficiency, so you can measure it. As we add functionality, you see performance drop. But what we'll do is we'll make sure it's pluggable, so that if you want the basic functionality, you still get a high performance. If you want the more advanced functionality, you just tick it on, and then you see the performance degradation. Um, so it's going to be really, really interesting, everyone, um, to go through. That's fundamentally the approach that I'm taking. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, what we're going to start on next time is we're going to talk here, term listing and hashing. Uh, we're going to start there as the basis, and that's why I wanted to go through this explanation, because if I just introduced term listing and hashing without an explanation for what that enables, I think you'd have been like, well, I don't care about this. Tell me about eventual consistency, because that's why everybody... You know defaults to which is totally reasonable but fundamentally you need to understand term listing and hashing and how to efficiently store and retrieve data before you can build a good database so 
that's where we're going to start. We'll talk through these things. We'll prove the efficiency and the richness to you, and then we'll build up from there. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Please, please do subscribe. It will help me eventually get paid for like five dollars a month, which will you know pay for new T-shirts and mugs and stuff. So, uh, if you could please subscribe to this, add comments, let me know what you want to see because. If I don't know, I'll pick something. So you're probably better off asking for it, okay? Um, but I hope you enjoyed it and keep in touch. Thanks very much for your time.